apocalypse. When an entire people are destroyed or destroy themselves. The end of civilization. For us today, as we go about our daily lives, it's barely something we consider. We're so sure it couldn't happen to us. But for some civilizations, it already has. Since the dawn of human history, we have told each other stories about the sea, about its power over life and death. In the Torah, the Quran, and the Bible is the story of the Great Flood. When Noah built an ark as the sea flooded the land, killing everything in its path. Societies all across the world are replete with examples of stories of lands that have been lost and covered over. People have done something wrong and this is God's punishment. Or the story of the lost city of Atlantis, told by the great Greek philosopher Plato. A utopian island that people have devoted their lives to finding beneath the waves. Right across the world, in almost every culture, there is a flood story a story where water can both cleanse and destroy. Across our planet are myths and legends of the sea rising up and wiping out civilizations. But what if these stories aren't just stories? Scientists now claim to have found a lost world at the bottom of the sea. Called Doggerland. It existed about 10,000 years ago and was a place that was almost perfect for its Stone Age inhabitants. It's a rich place. It has wetlands where you had wildfowl in abundance, where fish in the rivers were migrating, where you had all the animals and plants that you'd want and also all the resources, flints and wood and everything else was out there. Doggerland's temperate climate would have made this a beautiful and abundant region for its hunter-gatherer population. Plants and animals that we recognize today, hazel, ash, pine, large game, horse, bison, deer, antelope and elk. Doggerland sounds like paradise. But this world no longer exists. So we must ask the question, what exactly happened to Doggerland? Our search begins in the North Sea. This sea was created at the end of the Ice Age, about 15,000 years ago. As the ice melted and receded, it created the North Sea between Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and the UK. Its power and hidden depths have captured the human imagination. And it has also, for thousands of years, provided humans with a staple food. Fish. From the east coast of Great Britain, the British have for generations sailed from the ports of Norfolk, a hundred miles northeast of London, to fish the North Sea. And in September 1931, a vessel was trawling near the Lehman and Ower banks. It was captained by Pilgrim E. Lockwood. But 
about 25 miles out, he lowers his nets and he trawls the ocean for fish. As he lifted them up into the boat, among the sort of shining fish is a massive, what they call peat log. It's a big, like, boulder, not of rock, but of mud. He and his men start breaking it up with shovels. As he puts his shovel in, it goes Dun! And he's like, that's really weird. That sounds a bit like metal. So he digs through and he uncovers this sort of black shape. And on it is a load of ridges cut into it. So it's sort of almost like a, like a barb. And it's got little grooves at this end. So presumably this is some sort of, like, you know, a harpoon or hook or something. He prized away and found a lovely bone handle harpoon point. Intrigued, you don't find these things every day um, in the North Sea, he brought it home. Lockwood had found an implement made out of the bone from a deer's antler. About 15 centimetres in length and with a serrated side, so it could be used to harpoon prey. But how on earth did it get there? Because it's, it's in a load of mud, which has been under the ocean. What was the harpoon doing in the middle of the North Sea? Who made it and when? Our story now moves to Cambridge University. Here, in 1932, works a young, ambitious archaeologist called Graham Clark. Clark would go on to become one of Europe's greatest archaeologists, seen here winning the Erasmus Prize in 1990. Graham Clark, who's a very tenacious scholar. He wants to make a name for himself, and he's decided to study a whole new area um, that hasn't really been looked into before, which is the Mesolithic, the Middle Stone Age. Clark was fascinated by the period from about 10,000 to 4,000 years from today. Clark believed the harpoon from Lockwood was similar to those used by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers in Scandinavia, known as the Magal Mose. But this creates a greater mystery. Mesolithic hunter-gatherers were known to be able to fish and had fishing boats. But what were they doing harpooning fish so far out to sea? The first step for Clark was to identify that the harpoon was indeed Mesolithic. Today, scientists rely on a process called radiocarbon dating. This involves measuring the decay of the isotope carbon-14 and comparing that to levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But without this complex modern technique, how would Clark date the harpoon? To try and solve this, Clark turned to his friends and botanists, Harry and Margaret Godwin. The Godwins were a husband and wife couple, and they were from the University of Cambridge at the same time as Graham Clark. And they specialised in paleontology, the study of plants and their remains, things like pollen. Harry and Margaret Godwin were working on a technique that relied not on the decay of carbon isotopes to date objects, but instead used ancient pollen. The Godwins might not be able to date the harpoon itself, but they could date the peat it was found in through pollen analysis. They specifically went out and trawled up another block of peat, very, very close to where they'd found the harpoon, and actually analysed it.
what the Godwins found would change the way the seabed of the North Sea is seen forever. It was showing things that we have today, pine trees, older, as well as things like oak. You know, this wasn't a block of mushy mess that had come from an estuary. This was a part of a landscape that was living and breathing with all the things that we would expect on dry land today. These were plants which were nowhere near the sea. So what on earth are they doing underneath the North Sea? What the Godwins now had to do was work out what time period these types of tree and pollen were from. Working with other scientists in Scandinavia and Germany, they had built up a list of time zones, or chronozones, based on pollen found in prehistoric peat. The results are as Clark predicted. The pollen in the peat near where the harpoon was found dates to the Mesolithic age. This proves the harpoon is, most likely, from that period. But what Clark still can't answer is how did the harpoon get to the middle of the North Sea? Could the peat, pollen, and harpoon really have been washed out that far into the North Sea? Clark created a map showing pollen discoveries across northern Europe. And he wondered if there wasn't a landmass now hidden under the North Sea that had once linked all of northern Europe. A land that could have been inhabited by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. As it turned out, Clark wasn't the first to come up with this unusual idea. In the early years of the 20th century, the botanist Clement Reed used to walk the beaches and sand dunes of Norfolk in England. As a botanist, he was fascinated by the plants and trees of today and where they had originally come from. Clement Reed became obsessed with a thing called Noah's Woods. What it is, is when the tide goes out in some locations, you can see tree stumps, which is a bit odd. Loads of people at the time called this phenomena Noah's Woods because they thought they were leftovers, remnants of Noah's flood. But Clement Reed didn't think that was possible. So Clement Reed got the bit between his teeth and decided to investigate. Reed dug beneath the coastlines and into the depths of the sea to see what he could find. He asked the question, were there forests and animals living in these areas thousands of years ago? From his finds, Reed came up with a theory he published in a book called Submerged Forests. It suggested that somewhere under the North Sea was a landmass a landmass that could support forests and animals. Reed suggested there was an alluvial plain connecting all of Northern Europe, with its heart at somewhere called Dogger Bank. Clement Reed writes this amazing book called Submerged Forest, where he theorizes a massive landmass linking the UK to the rest of Europe. He had so little evidence for it, though. Nevertheless, this was a book that was really groundbreaking. His main issue was that nobody really cared. Nobody was really obsessed with this subject as much as he was. Reed's was a pretty unusual idea, without much evidence to support it at the time. And his work was derided by the scientific community. Reed's work was seen as nothing more than science fiction and was all but forgotten until 80 years later. In the 1990s, pioneering British archaeologist Professor Bryony Coles became intrigued about Reed's work. At the time of Professor Coles's work, 
Oil exploration in the North Sea was developing rapidly, allowing unexpected avenues of research. There was the geological surveys coming from things like the North Sea oil explorations of that period. I began to draw together the geological and the archaeological evidence that this was a, a terrain that had its contours, its river systems, that these were things that we were totally unaware of. Professor Coles used numerous maps, including the ones made by Graham Clark in the 1930s, to estimate how the ice caps melted after the Ice Age and what land masses that might have created. I realized quite soon that we needed to have maps showing the changes at intervals because things were changing and it might take a thousand of years to change. Cole's work suggested that in the region where the harpoon was found, there might actually have been dry land. But would anyone accept Professor Cole's idea? When I was doing the mapping, I realized that it would be much easier not have to say the land that used to be under the North Sea every time, but to give it a name of its own. To get across the idea that it had been not just a drowned landscape, but a living, live, dryland landscape. Based on the name of the fishing area Dogger Bank, Coles called this new landmass Doggerland. And that's really important because as soon as somewhere has a name, it becomes a place, not just in reality, but also in the imagination. And Coles went on. She posited the theory that not only was Reed correct about the existence of a lost landmass in the North Sea, but it meant something even more unexpected. It was a huge area with rivers, with bays and inlets, with areas of high ground, hills, if you will, and low-lying areas that are now entirely submerged, but then would have been absolutely at the heart of the post-glacial landscape of Northern Europe. So if this was a landscape, was there evidence to suggest that it had one day supported human life? Across the North Sea, in present-day Holland, a few hundred miles from Norfolk, is the beach of Zanmota. There, beachcombers hunt for hidden treasure. Coins, bones, a message in a bottle, anything unusual gifted by the sea. The beachcombers coordinate their finds with Dr. Luke Amkrutz, a specialist archaeologist from the nearby University of Leiden. They work with Dr. Amkrutz because Zanmota Beach isn't like any other beach. Yeah, I'm sitting here on Zanmota Beach, but it's not an ordinary beach. It's a beach created by man in 2011 by spraying a whole lot of sand from the North Sea on this beach plain. It was constructed out of materials dredged up from the sea floor 11 kilometers offshore and dumped on the existing beach. Material dredged from an area of the sea close to where Lockwood found the harpoon. What was so special when they created this beach is that all kinds of objects came to the surface. Wow. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. They were the bones of animals living in, for instance, the ice ages, like woolly mammoth and, and woolly rhinoceros. Most astonishing of all is that it wasn't just the animal remains, but amongst these, there were also hundreds of artifacts made by humans and even by Neanderthals, which is, of course, really strange, given that they come from the North Sea. Over the years, beachcombers have found more than 500 ancient artifacts, including tools, bone fish hooks, and even human remains that they say are thousands of years old. Zandmota and certain other areas really brought home the enormity of, of uh, 
this, this huge archaeological archive in front of our coast. We have this whole range of organic artifacts that is preserved, and it's actually basically as if you're looking at a complete carpenter's tool set. And it really brought home the idea of this is a whole world, a whole people landscape that was there, which is now lost. The more touching finds from Doggerland are, are not just the artifacts, but, but the human remains themselves. And one, one story I find particularly moving is this, this lower mandible. This person was about 40 years when, when he or she died. You're not just looking at the objects or you're not just looking at the food remains, but you're looking at the actual people themselves. And Luke's group are not the only ones finding things on the beach. Since the 1970s, hundreds of amateur archaeologists have made findings on the coasts of the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and the UK. Under the North Sea, there are signs of an entire living world, of not just animals, but also people. But the question remains, who were they? And what happened to them? In 2005, a European team of scientists centered at the University of Bradford in the UK wanted to see exactly what Doggerland might have looked like. But they knew it wasn't going to be easy. The area obviously was very inaccessible. It's obviously underwater between, you know, five and 30 meters in some places down to 60, 80 in others. Obviously that water is very cold, so you can't go diving easily in it. It's very powerful currents in some places. The other thing of course was the technologies and the techniques that we use hadn't been developed in some cases or were in their early infancy. There was no way that archeologists could excavate under the seabed in these dangerous waters. It was beyond their technical abilities and would have cost hundreds of millions of euros. It looked like Doggerland would remain forever a subject of speculation and mystery, unproven by scientific fact. But at a yearly symposium, one of the PhD students at the time, Simon Fitch, had an unusual idea. As I was sitting there in the lecture hook, I realized that actually I'd worked on material, you know, seismic data which came from that area. And that data possibly could be retasked. It could actually be used to look under the water to see the landscape. In the early 2000s, the North Sea was going through a renewed oil and gas boom. Billions of euros worth of oil and gas were being discovered using new technology. If the Bradford team could access the data from that technology, then maybe they could see under the seabed and whether there was evidence that Doggerland did once exist. The Bradford team approached oil and gas exploration companies to access their specialist mapping data. Surveyors for oil and gas exploration were going up and down, surveying the North Sea uh, with a, a fine toothed comb to pull together a series of contour maps of the sea floor. This was a huge swathe of land, tens of thousands of square kilometers. What the Bradford team wanted in particular was the data for 3D seismic maps. These are created by specialist ships dragging thousands of listening devices called hydrophones along the surface of the sea. They listen to sound waves bouncing off whatever lies beneath the seabed. The resulting data shows where, hidden under the seabed, there may be deposits of oil or gas to drill for. Seismic mapping is a really good way to do a quick analysis of a large amount of, of submerged landscape. Mapping the seabed in the same way as we see inside a stomach when we're doing sonograms, for instance. When you use the sonar pulses and you get a little echo back, 
and you get the shape appearing on the screen. But would this help the Bradford team? Could the data help build a picture of a land now hidden under the seabed? Having waited some months, the team finally got the data for the Doggerland area. They inputted it into a computer. They waited for the first seismic maps. So we plugged that in and then put it into the computer and up popped this remarkable image. We could actually see a river which was alive and vibrant when the Mesolithic people were wandering around on top of Dogger Bank. It was a phenomenal, almost like lunar landing time type of moment. You know, you felt you were seeing something which no one had ever seen before. I think that was when all the jewels dropped and we realized the implications of what we were looking at and was providing a doorway into a lost world. It was just a phenomenal realization that all those questions that people had had before us could be answered. It was just as Bryony Coles and Clement Reed had suggested. A hidden world of rivers, lagoons, and wetlands. We could map features in the landscape. We've seen rivers, we've seen lakes, we've seen little hills. We've seen everything in a landscape you'd expect in a normal country, except this is under the sea and it's preserved and it's caches of material and archaeology sitting out there waiting for us to go and find it. The Bradford team had seen Doggerland for the first time. But the mapping still didn't answer the biggest question. What happened to the peoples who lived there? To understand that, scientists had to investigate how the people might have lived. Human evolution is heavily influenced by geography and climate. So the first thing to establish is roughly what kind of climate Doggerland would have had. This is done by looking at the position of Doggerland geographically at the time. We know that immediately after the end of the last ice age, it was frozen, it was like the Siberian tundra, but then very rapidly started to warm, to thaw out. And that enabled new species to start to colonize this land. Doggerland would have grown into a landscape that we would recognize now. The winters were shorter and less harsh and the summers were longer and warmer. And plants start to colonize this land. Trees start to grow. A lot of the species that we're familiar with now, so hazel, ash, oak, willow, animals start to colonize because they're following the food. So you get herds of horse and bison and elk but the question remained, could Doggerland support human populations? And if so, what would those people have been like? A clue comes from Yorkshire in Northern England. In 1948, Graham Clark, the archeologist who had dated the harpoon from the North Sea, was told of a discovery of flint and bone at a place called Star Car. 10,000 years ago, it was on the edge of a massive paleo lake. Because of the nature of this landscape and the waterlogging in the modern farmland, it means that there's been an incredible level of preservation at Star Car. For the next three years, Clark led the dig at Star Car and his team uncovered one of the best Mesolithic settlements in Europe. So we have organic remains, animal bones. There are harpoon points beautifully crafted from deer antlers. By looking at Star Car today, we can build a picture of what lives the people of Doggerland might have led. The site has been further excavated by Professor Nikki Milner. 
I think it's very easy to sometimes look at the past and think back 11,000 years and that people must have lived very basic lives. But the, the evidence that we've got from Starcar is that they were very good at, at making things, at crafting things. Starcar shows many tools made from animals and made to kill animals, similar to the harpoon Lockwood found in 1931. We have all sorts of animal remains and plant remains from the site, which, which shows us uh, the types of animals they're hunting and their expertise in, in gathering and, and, and living off the land. They're hunter-gatherers, and these are bushcraft experts. They're, they're armed with a whole range of skills and expertise that means that they can thrive in this landscape. At Starcar is also what's known as the oldest house in Britain, dating from about 9,000 years ago. So we found a number of, of houses, which are the earliest known houses in this country. So that told us that people were, were able to build structures out of, out of wood. We understand more about their woodworking skills and how sophisticated those must have been, and that they could, they could make structures, and that involves teamwork. Mesolithic people, it appears, were hunter-gatherers. They were highly mobile, but they were also living together and growing together as a community. If we're now thinking about people who have places that they regularly spend long periods of time at, that they invest their resources in to build houses, no longer could we write these people off as simple, knuckle-dragging, cave dwellers, clad in simple animal skins, eking away a living at the edges of the Ice Age. These were people who shaped their landscape. One of the most unusual finds at Star Car was shaped from the skulls of killed deer. One of the most iconic and remarkable discoveries from Star Car are the antler headdresses and they've been shaped by human hands over hours and hours and hours of labour. The headdresses are really mysterious. There are none others known in this country and only a few in the rest of Europe. They're made of red deer skulls with the antler coming out of them. There are two main theories. One is that they might have been used as disguises in hunting practices, and the other is that they might have been used by shamans in some kind of ritual practices. The headdresses offer clear, incontrovertible evidence that these people had a sophisticated culture to create these artefacts that have no functional purpose, but clearly have a very important spiritual purpose. Starcar helps build a picture of how sophisticated people might have lived on Doggerland. But who were these people? What did they look like? To see what a Mesolithic person might have looked like, we must travel to the south of England and the Cheddar Gorge. It was here that one of Europe's oldest Mesolithic men, Cheddar Man, was found. Cheddar Man is one of the really important discoveries in this country. Cheddar Man was found over 100 years ago in uh, Somerset and um, has been studied a lot ever since because human remains are incredibly rare, um, particularly in this country for the Mesolithic. Cheddar Man is the oldest British, most complete human skeleton that we have. It dates to around 10,000 years old. And in 2018, a groundbreaking analysis was made of Cheddar Man's DNA in an attempt for us to meet our ancestors face to face. It gives us an insight into what people look like. And what we know from Cheddar Man is he was about five foot five. From the DNA, we know he had dark, curly hair, blue eyes, and darker skin than we imagined, certainly darker than European skin tends to be today. So although he looks quite uh, striking to us, he would have looked quite normal then. Now we could finally see the faces of the sort of people that would have lived at Star Car and Doggerland. Despite living thousands of years ago, it helps us understand who lived here 
but it still doesn't answer the big question. How did people who made Doggerland their home come to disappear? To understand better what might have happened, the Bradford team decided to actually dig into Doggerland. They did this by taking core samples. If you take a giant pipe, you ram it into the seabed, and then you pull it out, the column of mud that you pull out, that's a core. So when you look at a core, what you're effectively looking at are slices of time. It's like a diary of the deep past. They are hugely important for our understanding of how our climate has changed and environmental conditions have changed. And they're also crucial to our understanding of the archaeology of Doggerland and what happened to the people. What the Bradford team saw is how, with the end of the Ice Age, the sea level was rising at over a metre every hundred years. Those sediments preserve in them a record of how sea level changes. So at one particular site, it will show the history of going from dry land through to the area becoming waterlogged and eventually being submerged. But the team noticed that in one particular time period, the sea levels seemed to rise significantly. If you look at the cores taken from Doggerland, when you get to 8,000 years ago, there's a huge change. But what caused this huge change? And what effect did it have on Doggerland? Around 8,000 years ago, there is what is called the 8.2 kilo year event, meaning 8.2 thousand years from today, or roughly, 6,250 BCE. Scientists noticed that the planet's sea levels rose dramatically. One explanation for this change is with the warming of the planet after the Ice Age came the collapse of a colossal ice sheet into the Atlantic Ocean. The Laurentide Ice Sheet in what is present-day North America at its peak, the Laurentide Ice Sheet covered most of Canada and a fair proportion of the top of the United States. Ice was over what is now New York and Chicago and St. Louis. This was millions and millions and millions of tons of water locked up in ice. This was the biggest release of fresh water into the North Atlantic for 100,000 years. So profound was this change that it dropped the sea temperatures by a degree, almost overnight. And that changed the Gulf Stream, which changed the air temperatures by up to 1.5 degrees centigrade in a generation. As the meltwater filled the oceans, global sea levels rose by as much as half a metre in a few months, threatening lowlands like Doggerland. All the reasons that made Doggerland a fantastic place to live as a hunter-gatherer also made it particularly vulnerable to sea level change. It was low-lying. It was cut through with rivers and streams and marshy areas, which was fantastic for fishing and fowling and gathering those wild resources. But it also meant that if the sea levels rose, it would be inundated and inundated very rapidly. The sea level rise was so pronounced that it turned Doggerland into islands. Doggerland would now have been cut off from continental Europe and the UK. So what did this mean for the people on Doggerland? After the 8.2 event, the sea levels rose so significantly that it was easily within generations, easily within people's lifetimes. They could easily see the effects of sea level rise. These people had an intimate knowledge of the landscape around them. And for that to start changing must have been extraordinarily disorientating and confusing. What would have been fertile river valleys suddenly became flood valleys. Huge swathes of low-lying land would have been lost almost immediately and that destroys the animals you're relying on, that destroys the plants you're relying on. 
And so when all this changes, this puts huge pressure on the people living there. And it would have been scary for them. The hunter-gatherer paradise of Doggerland was slowly sinking beneath the waves. So what could Mesolithic people do? If you're a Mesolithic person and your land gets flooded, where do you go? Well, you obviously, you know, follow the animals, follow the herds. That's, you know, where your food source goes. So you're going to do that because some of them would have gone to Britain and what is now mainland Europe. Some of the people would have relocated into other parts of today's Europe, like Germany and the Netherlands, and others to Great Britain. From the archaeological evidence, we have a number of Mesolithic boats. It's exactly at this point as the sea levels are rising, that we start to get this really good evidence for the use of dugout canoes in, in Britain and in Northwest Europe. Hunter-gatherers are fantastic at being flexible. And maybe even people started adapting to being much more sea-dwelling. But the question remained. What happened to the people who stayed on Doggerland? As the Bradford team looked further into the core samples, they found something that would have been terrifying. They found what might be the key to the apocalypse of Doggerland. In a time period around 6000 BCE, the core samples looked more mixed up than expected. There was a series of sand, shell jumbled up with sequences within which looked so unusual, so different to everything else we'd seen in our careers, except for the few samples we've seen published in the literature, which were Stoon Army samples. This mixing up of sediment suggested huge force, a great wave of power, a tsunami. But what could have caused such a wave? The team connects the unusual core samples to an event called the Sterega Slide, when vast areas of the Norwegian continental shelf slid into the sea. The Sterega Slide was a huge submarine landslide that occurred off the coast of Norway. The slide itself is made up of sediments deposited from the glacial era, so it's a lot of fine muds and sands. And within it, there are lots of weak layers. These are layers that can't really hold all that sediment together. So they're very prone to slipping. So any trigger, like an earthquake, is enough to set this sediment in motion and move down slope. And as it does so, it will generate a wave because it will disturb the surface of the water. A tsunami would have been terrifying. And it's something that our modern society has witnessed. In both 2011 in Japan and across Asia in 2004. You can see here how the 2004 tsunami spread across almost the entire globe. So what effect would the Storega slide tsunami have had on Doggerland? Dr. John Hill of the University of York recreated how the tsunami might have hit Northern Europe in a series of computer simulations. The Storega slide involved 3,000 cubic kilometers of sediment and it probably moved in one go very quickly. So this huge slide, which is probably one of the biggest landslides in the history of the Earth, generated a huge tsunami, which then traveled across the North Atlantic to Greenland and then down the North Sea with a tsunami of 10 to 6 meters impacting the coast of the UK. In this scientifically accurate simulation, the remaining islands of Doggerland are repeatedly washed over by the elevated red waves. The core samples also suggested that the timing of the wave was critical for people on Doggerland. So one of the things I find surprising is our ability to pinpoint the time of year that Sterega occurred. So we do this by looking at the sediments that have been deposited, and in them we find bits of vegetation like mosses and cherry stones, where we know that they would have occurred in the autumn. And hence, we can find out that the Sturega slide actually happened in the autumn. It is believed that Mesolithic people in the summer went inland to hunt deer. But in the autumn, with fewer deer to eat, they returned to the shoreline. 
the tsunami from the Sterega slide would have hit the Mesolithic people when they were at their most vulnerable. Dogland would have been particularly affected by this because it is so low lying. Even though it was about 130 kilometers across and perhaps 80 kilometers north to south, the average height was probably on the order of meters rather than tens of meters. So if you have a wave that is five meters high, it is obviously going to inundate a large proportion of that land. And if we look to modern events like the Japanese 2011 tsunami, the average height there is around five meters. The wave inundated up to four kilometers in land. So if you think of that kind of scale, you would have seen something similar happening at Doggerland. The coastline is exactly where we would have seen the majority of people, the tsunami, would have laid waste to homes, fish traps going, hunting grounds disappearing. Whole societies were perhaps wiped out in the space of a few hours. For Doggerland, it could have been cataclysmic, covering most of the land in its fast-moving water. Many of those Doggerland people could have been washed away along with their homes. From the archaeological record, we do get a sense that actually the tsunami is the beginning of the end, if not the end of Doggerland. And large swathes of it are already underwater. And what remains would have been quite significantly devastated for some time. Death as a great wave swept through Doggerland. Doggerland still occasionally gives up its human evidence from beneath the seabed. In 2019, a hammer stone was dredged up from the drowned land. But the Bradford team concluded that with rising sea levels, Doggerland, the land that connected all of Northern Europe, would have sunk under the sea, ending all human life. The Storega tsunami was a difficult period for the Mesolithic people, but the land did recover. However, after that period, sea level continued to rise. The landscape continued to shrink and break up into different islands. So the challenges increased for people. And so really, it's part of the beginning of the end. Eventually, people would have found it perhaps too difficult to live in certain places and moved. As of today, scientists are yet to find any artifact from the Doggerland area the dates after the tsunami. We don't find any human artifacts after this wave. So there's absolutely nothing that dates from younger than 6,100 BC, which just shows the devastation this wave probably caused. The tsunami's devastation seems total. Doggerland. A Mesolithic paradise that supported human populations, animals, forests, and wetlands. A land that at one point is estimated to have stretched from what today is Northern Europe to Scandinavia and the UK, covering almost 50,000 square kilometers. Hunter-gatherers of the time could have walked from present-day Berlin to Oslo, to London, to Paris. A region that in the space of possibly only a few hundred years was completely swallowed by the sea, drowning everything that lived on it. An ancient apocalypse which echoes through human history through the myths and legends of great floods and still touches us today.